Hello there, I'm Derek Fournier and welcome to Plain Spoken, a podcast where we get real about business, leadership, and life. I've spent years in the trenches of leadership and team building, and now I'm bringing those conversations out into the open. We're going to talk strategy, dissect success, and maybe share a few laughs along the way. Each episode, I'll be joined by fascinating guests, from successful CEOs to brilliant minds shaking up their industries. We're here to offer you insights, challenge your perspectives, and ignite your curiosity. So whether you're a seasoned professional or just starting out, there's something here for you. Join me on this journey of exploration as we make sense of the complex world of business, one conversation at a time. Let's dive into today's episode of Plain Spoken. Bo Billington, founder of The Free Agent, has cultivated a significant presence in the gig economy. Focusing on maximizing the value of fractional executives and leveraging the flexibility and innovation this model brings to companies, The Free Agent has a vetted bench of executive leaders with backgrounds in sales, marketing, and technology that are available on a fractional, interim, or full-time basis. The Free Agent works across a multitude of industries and disciplines with a keen focus on technology companies with revenues ranging from $8 million to $30 million. His work and insights aim to transform business approaches through strategic use of fractional talent, particularly for firms navigating growth and operational challenges. Well, welcome back to Plain Spoken. As mentioned in the introduction, I am honored to be here with Bo Billington, founder of The Free Agent. And rather than me uh, reiterate what I said, what I really want to do to open up this conversation, and it's the first one back with an interview. I've been doing some solo versions of this, Bo, because as it turns out, podcasting is only valuable if you do it regularly. It's it's almost like bowel movements. You've got to do them all the time or it's just yes. not really useful. Yeah. There's the simile of the day. Podcasts are like bowel movements. Bo, tell us about The Free Agent. Tell us how you came to found The Free Agent and why you are passionate about fractional executives. Wow. Well, first and foremost, Derek, thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. Um, glad to be here. And I'll try to keep this relatively brief. So I, I've been in business for seven years. The, the company that I, that I own is the free agent. And, you know, kind of like the, the highlight reels, we work with like high growth tech companies, almost exclusively B2B, B2C SaaS companies that are you know, hitting hyper growth. So most companies have, you know, revenues like you know, six, seven million in ARR up to about 20 or 30 that larger and smaller clients. But, you know, our ideal client profile uh, is, is not pre-revenue or at least they're, they're funded and trending. They've got product market fit. And most importantly, the founders have a growth mindset. Uh, and I've found that if the founders don't have a growth mindset and the fractional space just doesn't provide a lot of value. Uh, but we work across a couple of different silos, sales and marketing, tech and product, ops and finance. And then we've also got a marketplace that is in its fifth iteration, which was the original concept of the free agent seven years ago. Um, and I'm surprised my wife hasn't killed me yet, but it's, it's close to a launch and I'm really pumped and uh, we've kind of come full circle. Um, in, in regards to, you want jump into kind of like the, the passion and, and how I kind of- Yeah, absolutely. It. Yeah. So, so, the, so the abridged vi- vi- version of this is that I've always kind of had the entrepreneur spirit, always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, I was in Toronto two days before Christmas, had like a nine month old, and uh, I was there because somebody told me I needed to be there. And I was terrified that I was going to miss Christmas, the first Christmas with my daughter. Uh, and, and so I was sitting there at the bar because all my meetings got canceled because the water, the, the weather was so horrible. And ESPN was in the background talking about how so-and-so was going to be a free agent. Um, I wish for the life of me, I can remember who, who the star was. I remember it was an NBA player. Um, but that was kind of like the light bulb moment where I realized like how cool would it be if I was a free agent myself and could represent, you know, one, two, three different companies over the course of a year be in control of my destiny and not miss special events, right? Like that was kind of the, the crystallizing moment for me. Um, got home and, you know, ended up leaving that company, worked for another company for two years, but just could not shake the thought of being a free agent myself. Uh, did a tremendous amount of research, um, had a second kill, kid, built a house and decided that the timing was never going to be perfect. So I jumped out April of 2017. And uh, now we're, we're sitting here in, in August of 2024. Wow. Uh, it's interesting that ESPN spurred the whole thing. Now, with the concept of free agency may be alien to some folks. In fact, I'm, I'm surprised because my company actually, by a different name, sort of offers those sorts of services under sure. the guise of advisory services. Uh, can you, you talked about the sort of ideal customer profile. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but can you talk a little bit about what advantages you see in leveraging uh, a fractional or a free agent as opposed to going the traditional route? Sure. So, so, so a lot to unpack there. And first and foremost, I mean, this is, this is really kind of akin to like a staff on model, right? So, so mm-hmm. companies have been doing this for years, predominantly in tech and finance. Now there's other avenues that they're looking, right? So it's basically it's like tech finance marketing, and now companies are leveraging fractional execs and you know, operations, sales, you know, any functional area that you can literally dream up that could be applicable to, to a fractional exec. Um, and, you know, generally when talking about kind of the fractional space, uh, we, we, we at least bring folks to the table that may have two to three other opportunities that they're working at any given time. Um, so fractional to me, and I know there's some, some confusion in the marketplace and there's some strong opinions on what it is and what it's not. The fractional to me is a fraction of a work week, right? Typically, we look to bring on an executive that's going to dedicate a day at the minimum side, the left hand bracket, two to three days. In some cases, five days, but that's usually a project. Um, but generally working with one client, you know, one to two days a week, but then probably have a portfolio. It's a portfolio of business for these people where they've got maybe one, two, three different clients that they service over the course of the week. Okay. And so if you flip the script a little bit and put yourself in the place of your of the companies who hire your free agents, right? So you alluded to, you didn't allude to, you flat out talked about the marketplace. Yeah. And I think people can draw the parallels uh, the staff og model, this is something that's historically been done <clears throat> at a more utilitarian level, let's just yes. say. I, I can't come up with a word that doesn't sound like a pejorative, right? Yeah. Um, people don't often think of it as the executive level, right. which is really kind of odd. Uh, they they instead use a corporate recruiter. They spend $150,000 on a referral, yeah. and they pray that the person they married as their new CEO, CFO, CIO, whatever – is the right person. There yeah. is no lease with an option to buy. Right. Uh, put yourself in the role of that company. Why sure. would you leverage a free agent? So it's so a great question. And I also like the distinction and the, the term we usually use is, is tactical, right? So there's the tactical, yeah, that's good. Uh, tactical kind of workforce, you know, added to horsepower, but you know, you've got some tasks, uh, a lot oftentimes repetitive, but you're working in a team. Um, we're typically in that kind of strategic layer where you're, you know, laying the foundation and the groundwork for an organization. Um, so, you know, you brought up a couple of different interesting points here. Um, first and foremost, uh, there is kind of a new model, which is the try before you buy. So some companies are leveraging this quote unquote fractional work model, um, contract model, where they're bringing on an executive on a three, six month contract to try them out. Um, that way, you know, they lessen the burden on paying recruiters. They lessen um, typically the, the cash outlay as it pertains to like bonus commission, but also there's no equity um, or stock options at risk. And then after that six month period, you can roll them permanent. Uh, and, and of course, you know, everybody's selling something uh, and it generally takes, you know, 90 days, I think is too short, but six months, maybe even nine months before you realize kind of where the bodies are buried. And more importantly, can you work with the person sitting across from you? So that's an interesting model and kind of the contract to hire that we're seeing a lot of these days. And it makes sense for both the company as well as the individual. Um, on more of the fractional side, you know, a lot of companies that leverage fractional resources uh, or bootstrapped, maybe they're um, seed, pre-seed, looking for a Series A. Um, so that's kind of a sweet spot that I've found. And again, growth mindset for the company, um, but may not have the resources or the cash to hire a full-time individual, but still need that, that air support. So uh, the fractional model is really interesting in that scenario where it could be you know, a, a budding um, CEO, a budding CRO or VP that really needs... Um, some support from a more senior person that's, you know, already been in that situation before, you know, overcome that situation before and moved on. Uh, and then lastly, we see a use case a lot when companies are maybe testing a hypothesis, um, you know, want to kind of try out some some sort of new initiative or, um, you know, new product launch. Uh, that's another great area to leverage fractionals because, you know, you're not locking somebody in to this, you know, one, two, three, three year long engagement. It's literally kind of come in, maximize value, and then from our vantage, work yourselves out of a job. And that's the essence of fractional work. And if you're not doing that, I don't know if you're adding enough value. Fascinating. So you you hit on a topic that I had, we've certainly discussed, but I don't think it's enough focus. And it's the mentorship uh, aspect yeah. that fractional can provide. Yes. And like when I founded Plain Sight, one of the ideas was that the co- companies in that SMB space couldn't and shouldn't afford someone 
that has the experience, uh, skills, whatever combination, the cornucopia that you want to discuss. Um, so they they typically are, are brute force. It's founder led, best effort, grow into bumps and bruises. And there's nothing wrong with that. Find true model to just brute force through it. But the idea of being able to pull someone in uh, who's just sort of the uh, the the archetypes are the grizzled old vet, but it doesn't have yeah. to be that. Someone who's been there and done that is probably something you see a lot more of than people might expect. Is that some a scenario that you see used quite regularly? Oh, 100%. And, and you nailed it a few moments ago with the founder-led component, right? That's that's generally a great use case for the fractional. And we see it a lot on the sales side of the house. Uh, founder-led, founder-run sales. Sales begin to flatline or maybe decrease over a period of year. Maybe they've had some success, you know, grew the company to... You know, eight, 10, 15 million in ARR, and then all of a sudden everything just seem, seemingly falls apart overnight. And that, that's, that's where we see a lot of folks that are in need of a CRO because whatever they were doing before may have worked, but it's no longer working now. And a lot of times it's because they don't have process, procedure, or any infrastructure in place uh, for success. Uh, and so that is a great use case for, for a fractional exec. And we see that a tremendous, a tremendous amount, um, which, which is great. Another thing I want to hit upon, um, you mentioned about, you know, kind of hiring full time. And, and I think, not I think, I know that the fractional model and use case lends itself really well for growth companies because, you know, if a company like kind of the, uh, the de facto standards like, hey, you have grown sales X when you go find a full time CRO. That's great. But a lot of times the full time CRO that you need is not going to take the small package that you can offer. If they do, that should be a very big warning sign to me. Uh, and more importantly, a lot of times they're going to be a flight risk, right? So you get right. this individual in, they're in for six months. All of a sudden they realize that, you know, they, they bought a bad bill of goods. Um, the infrastructure is non-existent. They've got to carry a bag and sell, um, sorry, and, 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 and provide, you know, kind of that sales leadership component. And they're gone. They're gone six months, eight months. And you've, you've spent, you know, 40 grand with the recruiter, if not much, if not more. You've, you've spent six months of, of your company's life and spend that you'll never get back. And that's a really um, sticky situation. And I think a, a fractional exec can be almost like the training wheels, getting you prepared, getting you ready to kind of bring in somebody full time to take the reins. Yeah, it's 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 interesting, the scenario you just painted, because the sometimes I think we don't talk about the package that people receive in these compensation models no. as being a great sort of canary in the coal mine right? Um, to determine Hey, you know, how serious an opportunity is. And and you hate the idea of someone job hopping or landing and then leaving. But the reality is yes. every, every month you spend somewhere is a month of your life. You don't get back. Right. And so they've got to be, both sides of this coin have to be investing and totally. investing at an appropriate level. Um, no, that's a great point. The comp package is there's usually a, a very, very large um, dis discrepancy between what the CRO, again, just using the CRO as an example here, because I feel it's the easiest, um, but what, what they were, were earning at the previous job and what the smaller company can offer. I mean, I'm talking about a magnitude of like 50K on base, right? Mm -hmm. And then equity and options and everything. And, and most folks, you know, there, there, there should be a question mark. It's like, why would you, why would you take a, a $50,000 base pay cut, you know, for a promissory note that probably won't pay dividends down the road? Yeah, it's funny. The the promissory note, the equity component, however it's structured, is always one of those variables. You know, uh, whether you're talking about short term or long term incentive plans, you're you're betting on the future. And, and there's almost like this fake Hollywood thing where, well, if you were really committed, you'd lump everything into the long term and you'd show that you're there for the long haul, et cetera. Yeah. But the reality is there's some things that are guaranteed and some things that aren't. Right. Um, and and balancing those is, is one of those tricky, tricky uh, examples. Can you look into your bag of tricks, your bag of experience? You've been doing this for quite some time and give us a case study. You can, you know, uh, obfuscate the names to protect the innocent uh, sure. in so much as you need to. Or you can use names because they're one of your case studies. But an example where someone maybe is looking for a CRO or a CEO mm -hmm. or I don't care, pick your CXO level. Yeah. Uh, and they've leveraged your approach and sure. it's worked out really well. Second question, one where it hasn't. OK, yeah, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you. Yes, I got, I got three three thoughts real quick. I've kind of alluded to the CRO component already. Um, founder led, founder grown sales. You know, you, you get the company to 10, 15 million, it falls apart. Um, look under the hood. Uh, maybe you got lucky with kind of your your um, you know your network. Uh, maybe product market fit worked for one company. Uh, maybe the market dynamics change. But regardless, sales start to flatline or decrease, and the founder is out of their depth. 
so that that's a great opportunity to bring in a CRO. And, and we actually brought one in um, for a company. It was a period of uh, nine months, nine months, a little bit on the longer side, but this was kind of like through COVID. So there's more blocking and tackling that was actually needed above and beyond just sales and go to market. But I think that's a, that's a really interesting use case for a fractional exec, particular CRO is when sales flatline, there's no infrastructure or maybe turnover is high, right? Turnover is mm -hmm. high generally as a reason, either it's, it's, it's cultural and there's something systemic that's wrong with the company or, or maybe they can't sell. And a lot of times what I hear from the founder as well, salespeople should sell, they can't sell, we're just hiring poorly. Like to me, that's a great right. trigger for, no, there's, there's a much bigger problem. Maybe it's the founder, maybe the product market fit no longer works, you know, whatever, but it, it's, it's time to bring, bring somebody in for some air support. Um, another interesting uh, component or, or use case on the more financial and CFO side, and we see this a lot as well as a company hits 15 million ARR and they're like, but we need a CFO full time. And I don't generally think it's like a general rule, like a company that's sub 20 million ARR, especially in the B2B SaaS world, do they need a full time CFO? I, I think absolutely not. Right. But what we do, they need finance support. Absolutely. They need somebody that's kind of got a keen eye on the future. hundred um, percent. So in those scenarios, what we typically suggest is, is bring on somebody, you know, a couple of days a week, um, maybe, you know, X amount of hours on a monthly basis, but then bring in a controller that can actually take the business forward and do the tactical work as we discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a great one, two combination on the finance side where you've got kind of the, the strategic support, but then also you've got somebody who can tactically help. Uh, and a lot of the CFOs that are out there, they're disinterested in the tactical work. You know, they're not right. trying to put together spreadsheets and models and, and all this, um, whereas the controllers love that work. And that's a, a great amalgamation of, of, of skill sets and also ends up reducing costs while keeping a keen, a keen eye towards the future. Uh, and then lastly, you mentioned a use case where it didn't work out. Um, yes. yeah, I've, I've got a great one here. And this, this was, was one part, and this was a few years ago. Um, we had an interest in, in getting into an organization, a $50 million company um, in an industry outside of tech. So, so definitely had a keen interest on just kind of, you know, meeting the customer in the middle, doing what we could to kind of, get somebody to the table uh, and it was a CFO. And we realized during the course of this engagement that there's a, there's a level of pain that the company needs to have to really take a fractional engagement seriously. And so in that example, we actually had too few hours at too low of a price point in hopes yep. of getting in and, and providing value and creating a bigger relationship down the road. Um, but what we found is, you know, month one, engine was humming, it was great. Month two came along and the CEO had other priorities. So he literally kicked the work to the next month and that happened again. And the CFO literally didn't have any work. Meanwhile, they were getting paid, but they felt unfulfilled. They also felt that they had a duty to kind of keep this slot and time open for the company, even though they weren't doing anything. And there's an opportunity cost associated with that. So long story short, you know, what we realize is that there is a threshold that you've got, you've got to have enough skin in the game from the company and a high enough price point for the fractional for this marriage to work. Otherwise, it, it's just it, it won't be prioritized by CEOs because, you know, every day is as busy as the last. That skin in the game concept, I think, is an ever present reality for any sort of contractual mm -hmm. engagement because every company, well, most companies have more things to do. Then yeah. they have time to do them. Yes. And so on Very the well stack, like right, on the stack mm -hmm. of crap to get done, yeah. you've got to create pain. And the pain has to be commensurate with the importance of the job to be done. Uh it's it's interesting because I know you and I have had off uh off podcast conversations about yeah. hourly versus value and all these sorts of things that people talk about. Right. People think in terms of hours, thanks to right. probably the lawyers of the world who have made right. this the common uh the common methodology. So unless someone is like, it's, it's almost like having an accountability partner for the gym, right? If I'm not paying someone, you know, $500 an hour, if I'm only paying them a buck 50 an hour, right? I, I may not care. I may be like, no, I, I'm just not going to have that meeting today. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Uh, we'll just pay it. And then that's fine for one month, two months, three months. But month four, my controller comes and says, why are we paying this? Right. You're, you're clearly not engaged, right? 100%. But, but also um, if you're paying that fee to, I mean, most often if they're like an honest, good person, they don't feel right about taking your 150 bucks if you're not showing up for the training session. And yeah. that was the situation we found. And literally the CFO was like, dude, I'm, I'm getting paid X amount per month. And I'm not doing anything. I, I actually want to work. I don't feel right about this. And, and I agree. And I raised her hand and we ended up 
close the contract down. It was totally, you know, uh, amiable between the, the two parties, but it was a, definitely a good lesson for me is that there is a price point and a commitment where that is, that is too low to make sense for both parties. Has, have you at the free agent or, you know, not necessarily done, but have thought about done when you, when you cross that sort of chasm of the doing, mm -hmm. there's a concept that this could morph into, which makes it almost like insurance. I don't necessarily have projects that I need to do, mm -hmm. but I need to know that when I pick up the phone, Bo's going to answer because Bo knows how to answer these questions. And I'll pay an amount to make sure that when that bat phone rings, right. Bo picks the damn thing up. <laughs> right. Now I yeah. may not pay him 500 bucks an hour, two days a week to be by the bat phone. Is that something you've considered? Uh, because I imagine that's a very different use case. Yeah, so so that would be fall under more of like advisory services. There'd be some small retainer, um, and yes, something we considered. Haven't had as much success in that realm because we've been laser focused on just kind of putting, um, I guess, fractional execs in, a, in in kind of a, a bigger capacity to work. But it's definitely something that's on the radar. Um, in fact, at, at one point, I think I've got a business book back here, or not business book, but a um, you know this game plan for the free agent. And in that, it was like you know twenty four seven hotline. Where you can phone a friend, and yeah. so it's something that I've thought about. It's it's there's a there's a lot of chips on the table, and and so it's been tough to figure out which ones to to, to utilize. But I think it's definitely an interesting point. It's a use case, and I would lump that more into that kind of advisory type mm -hmm. of work. Um, but yeah, companies like that do exist. Yeah, it's interesting because that that way the the professional doesn't feel like they're taking money inappropriately. Because I totally get that. Like if you're yeah you're supposed to be doing eight hours of work for someone and they're not giving you anything at some point, you just feel guilty about it and you want totally. to stop giving you money. Um, though, generally speaking, if someone wants to just start sending me money, I'm not going to be mad about it. Uh, <laughs> right. as, at some point, ethically, I would draw the line. So the demographics of work are changing significantly with, yes. with, with COVID. Um, and I, I, I find it almost intellectually dishonest to be talking about something from 2019 and 2020, though it obviously had a long tail and continues to exist as a, as a, Totally. Uh, threat yeah. today, uh, but it clearly caused a disruption in how we look at work. Right? Mm -hmm. Are you seeing co-location, physical return, any of those things as a challenge to or an accelerant for a free agency model? Wow. So, so great question. So, first and foremost, you know, from, from my vantage, if I'm talking to a client or a customer, I'm not going to try to change their mind. They, they fall in one of two camps: either they understand the value of fractional. Or they don't. Either they demand that their employees are in office in some sort of hybrid capacity, or or they don't. Um, so I, I typically try to kind of talk to people that understand it conceptually. Um, it, to answer your question, I, I do feel that COVID has had a tremendous effect on the fractional space at large. And in, in fact, you know, I've been in the business for seven years, and I've seen it change more in the last two years than at any time in the preceding five years. And a lot of that is is due to COVID, it's also due to um, the changing workforce, um, but also priorities. I, I feel like us as Americans um, are less interested in dedicating our time and our hours and working harder for less money for an employer and more interested in, in maximizing life. You know, I, I've got two kids, eight and 10. One of the, the reasons that I started my company uh, and, and the free agent was so I could spend more time at home and maximize my life and do, do work on my terms. Um, and particularly as we're seeing the, the changing of the population, the baby boomers are actually in a retirement age. Um, that's that's also kind of drastically increasing the interest for companies leveraging fractional execs. And I'm very bullish on the model. I think it's still a little early because there's a disproportionate amount of talent in the market uh, compared to kind of the demand. So supply and demand. But we're quickly that's quickly changing. And, and I, I, I'm confident, you know, in the next year and a half to two years it's going to be very, very common for a company, especially a bootstrap growth org, to have, you know, maybe three, three fifths of their leadership team as fractional execs, at least for the short term. You know, once they get to a series A from an optics perspective, a lot of times it does make sense to bring in full time. Plus, you have the capital, but it, things are changing and they're, they're changing uh, dramatically. So there's a lot to unpack on that answer. Um, with the supply and demand discussion. Let's yes. start at the end and work our way back. Um, how do you see that that balance getting to a normal level? Do you see the, the demand side increasing with the awareness? Do you see the supply side dropping off with mortality? Like where where do you see <laughs> yeah. that, where do you see that I, going? 
I didn't think about the, morta the mortality uh, component, but I mean, that, that obviously could, that could be part of it, right? But a, a lot of the influx of talent that we've seen has been directly correlated to the layoffs that we've seen in the tech sector. In the right. And so a lot of folks, uh, you know, also too, like, you know, fractional, it's, it's becoming popular. It sounds, in theory, it sounds really attractive and really awesome, yeah. right? I can work for three companies over the course of a year, vacation when I want to and, and work on my terms. Like, sign me up. Who, who would not want to do that? Um, but what we're also seeing, though, is a lot of folks that are maybe caught up in a, in a rift or the layoff are raising their their hand and saying, hey, I'm a fractional now, um, but really haven't even kicked the tires on, on what that means. And that's that's done a lot to kind of ratchet up the amount of supply that's in the market. And and it's it's really um, I don't want to say the market is saturated, but it, it's definitely um, caused a, a lot of confusion in the market because. Some people are like, yeah, I'm open to full time. I'm open to fractional. And I'm a big believer that if you spend 50% of your time on either one, you're not going to be that effective, right? It, it needs to be kind of an all in scenario. But I, I, once the once the tech sector comes back in, which hopefully will happen later this year, um, I, I'm confident that the amount of supply will be decreased and we'll, we'll be closer to some sort of equilibrium that makes sense for both companies and people. You seem to be hinting towards a tech sector rebound on the back end of their layoffs. Is that what you're implying there? I, you know, I, I've, I don't know. I, it's been, we, I've noticed a slowdown on full-time work uh, placement rather. Um, and I, we do both full-time as well as fractional. And candidly, when there's a lot more money in the, in the tech sector, we're doing more full-time. When there's less money in the tech sector, we're doing more fractional, which is why we do both. Um, and that's a topic for another day. But I'm seeing um, kind of a, a resurgence uh, as it pertains to full-time placement, kind of moving up a little bit. Which, which to me is a leading indicator that companies are reinvesting back in their business and reinvesting back in innovation. But I, I don't, I don't want, I don't want this to go live and, and people hold me accountable <laughs> for, for these opinions because candidly, I don't think anybody knows what the heck's going on there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one step away from playing roulette in Vegas in some yes. ways, but it, at least the trends, uh, you know, who knows? I'm not an economist either, but it does feel as though we're we're rounding the corner of a soft landing rather than a true recession. Yeah. And if that happens and the indicators start to tilt back upwards, then then companies will will start doing what companies do. Now, yeah. one of the other things on the, the big, long question that you answered with the really interesting pieces, uh, I've worked internationally for a long time. I think you have as well. The rest of the world seemed to kind of get this concept of work-life balance way before we did yeah. here in America. And I'm not even saying that here in America, we really get it yet. No, we do not get it at all. But- you seem to imply that we're getting it, which is one of the reasons that's propelling fractional yeah. uh, forward. Is this a trend you're seeing? Because I, mean, I, I didn't, when we started talking about having you on as a guest, I didn't think about the trends that you have access to, right? Because you're sure. doing full-time and fractional. Are you seeing this true desire for work-life balance start to become a prescient issue in employment? Yes, hundred percent. And I, I don't, do I think we're caught up with the rest of the world? Absolutely not. Do I feel like we're trending in the right direction? I do. It's baby steps though, you know, sure. um, but I, it is happening and I'm having more conversations with people like the fractional space of, you know, historically was, you know, somebody had a liquidity event, you know, somebody mm -hmm. exited the company, they're independently wealthy um, or they already have a consulting base, or maybe they're in the last third of, third of their career and they want to retire. Historically, that's been kind of the, the, the target folks that we've worked with and that we've put to work within organizations. Um, but now I'm seeing uh, individuals, you know, ages 30, call it 35 to, you know, 55, right? So, so in, in the prime earning years of their life that are opting to jump out, um, even maybe outside of a riff, like on their own accord to start mm -hmm. a fractional practice because they are interested in maximizing their life, but also they've got, you know, a very, very particular skill set that they can bring in the market and probably, you know, make more per hour um, than they were at their company. So absolutely, I feel it's trending in that direction. And it is a change of mindset in regards to maximizing work, sorry, life over work, you know, and family over conference calls. Yeah, it's it's interesting because your, your origin story really harkens to that, right? With the desire to spend more time with your kids. And I know there's it always floats around on Instagram and on LinkedIn, you know, the out of office message from someone in France who's like, yeah, I'll be gone for the summer. Yeah, uh, all of, all of yeah. I'm out. Yeah. 
<laughs> versus versus here we're like i'm going to have a you know heart bypass i'll be back at 3 15 and i'll be okay. watching email yeah. text, me for, text me for immediate yeah, for emergencies yeah totally yeah so it, it's an interesting refocus uh refocus on what what should probably matter the most um that's that's fun um so for people like me so use me as yeah. an example case it's funny I, I got very excited when you gave you talked <laughs> about the last third and i thought oh shit he's talking about me um <laughs> And then you went 35 to 55. And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm under the line. I'm in 52. <laughs> Woo I'm in the middle. Yeah. Third. So when you're talking to or when you're when you're working with these executives like people like me who've had an exit, mm -hmm. uh, don't want their brains to turn to mush, want the challenge of different experience, right? One of the things is when you're an executive, if, if you work for a company whose tech isn't that interesting or whose market sector isn't that interesting, right? Sometimes you just want the intellectual stimulation. The compensation yeah. matters, right? It's, it's yeah. not a hobby right? It's a job. Um, but, but how do you frame them in the right mindset to be able to shift? And for, especially for leaders, right? If you're talking about that C level, mm -hmm. right? How do you get them to understand that they can still engender the trust that is required, in my opinion, mm -hmm. for a C level uh, person only working part time, right? It's almost like it's a dichotomy. I'm not committed enough to be there full time, right? But I'm committed enough that you should trust me to be your CXO. Sure. So great, great question. Complex question. Um, in regards to the the, the the beginning beginning of it, a lot of the folks that we talk to, I mean, they they want to get out of corporate America because they're tired of the politics, tired of the red tape, and they they become very far removed from the work that they actually like. And you, I see this a lot on the tech side of the house, and also sure. the marketing side of the house. They they want to do the work. Right. They, 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 you know, I'm a you know, recovering nerd. I want to get back into the weeds and understand how it all works. <laughs> I hear that all the time. They want to be devoid of politics. Um, on, on the part about you know, establishing trust, I think a lot of that boils down to um, the fractional exec actually being laser focused on their ICP, their ideal you know, customer profile. Um, you know, what they do well, um, what they don't do, and, and more importantly, what they don't want to do. And that allows them to kind of, you know, cobble together and craft a compelling story and value prop. And so long as that's tied to like demonstrable experience, um, track record of success, I, I generally haven't really had any issues establishing trust and having a company, you know, kind of trust that individual. And, and one of the value props that I think is the best is that you actually bring in an objective advisor. I think it was Steve Jobs who said, why would you hire smart people if you don't listen to them? And it, it's kind of right. the same thing. Like to me, there are there is no politics. There is no agenda for the fractional exec outside of making sure they do a good job because you're a future reference. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that to me is is the core of establishing trust within the organizations. And I haven't seen much pushback on, hey, this guy's working a, an hour, you know, you know, a day a week. How can I trust him? Because well, he's he's look at his background. And they also, you know, the clients vet them as well. So it's not this, hey, I'm I'm bringing somebody to the table. Let's get them on payroll. No, it's it's a it's a whole process where we sit down and make sure it's the right individual, soft skills. More importantly, can we work together? Yeah, and, and I may have uh, not asked that question as well as I should have because I didn't mean to imply trust in that way. Um, like I don't think they're going to steal from the company necessarily, or you know, uh, abuse your dog or something. <laughs> uh, the the concept being when you're at that C level, when you're at that suite, the employees in a healthy organization, which right. we cannot assume all these organizations are healthy, they should believe that you have their best interests at heart. And if you're right. a stranger to them, that is nigh to impossible, right? Now, your point that you brought up is something really interesting. And it's, it's funny, mm -hmm. in, my, in my unpolished copy on my website, like I always used to lead with, I'm the guy you pay to call your baby ugly, right? <laughs> um, because the reality is you want an advisor who tells right. you the hard, their hard opinion. I used to say the hard truth, but that implies that I'm always right. And my yeah. wife tells me I say that too much. Um, it happens to be true sometimes. Right. <laughs> but you need an advisor who you can say, hey, look, here's our business plan. Here's our next 12 to 18 month right. plan. What do you think? And they need to be able to look at it and go, wow, that's a pile of crap. Sure. Right. And here are the 10 reasons why. Because you, yes, men are not what you're looking for. With, with that yeah. background in mind, and based on your experience doing this, what kind of advice can you give to someone who's maybe contemplating this? Maybe they're a gainfully employed CXO of some sort. They're yeah. a happily, happily a nerding away CFO, but they just had a kid. 
<laughs> it's funny. I'm going to use a bunch of subtext, and I'm hoping that a person is listening to this podcast. Let's say he's in his 60s, and yeah. somehow he convinced a woman to have children with him okay. who's way above his pay grade. Sure. Right? And he's going to have kids. God love him. He's the Energizer Bunny. And he doesn't want to do the full-time thing anymore. How would you counsel them to go into this effort, right? How would they prepare themselves for it? You talked about building their CV, et cetera. How would you counsel someone like that? Great question. I do want to come back to your earlier question um, as well about the, the trust component and just say okay. too that like panache um, and like the way that individuals carry themselves is, is, is also sure. part of the, the equation. Um, and, and not all consultants are, are created equal and, and not all consultants can garner that trust. That's that's needed. Just just FYI. Plus um, one for using panache, by the way. That's a hey, solid, hey, hey. solid SAT vocab word that is Look not that. used enough. Look at that. Um, so, and then, you know, to answer your question in regards to, you know, best practices for exploring the fractional space. Uh, so what I always, uh, cautionary tale to individuals when I talk to them is that this is, this is entrepreneurship at its finest. You are a solopreneur, you know, going out and getting business is up to you. If you're afraid of business development and networking, uh, if, if you're, you know, like if, if sleepless nights, scare you, then maybe it's not the right fit. Um, but, you know, if you do have the entrepreneur spirit, it, it, it is interesting to you. Uh, then I, I literally tell people to spend time while they're gainfully employed, work through their ICP, you know, ideal client profile, work through their value prop, um, work, work through like, you know, how can they productize their skill set? I feel far too, too many people, you know, say, well, I can do anything. Well, that, that's, that's really hard to sell, to sell and, and it's very hard to articulate. So, you know, what are the one, two, three areas where you can maximize value, do some research on that ICP. So identify, you know, what that company looks like, what industry, how many employees, what pain points they typically have. And I would, I would literally do research and due diligence on how many of those companies exist. You know, how many are in my area? I'm in Atlanta for, as an example. I would then go kind of in my network and find friendlies, uh, have conversations about what you're trying to accomplish, bounce ideas off of them. Um, you know, and one trap that I that I got into when I first started my company is I was talking to anybody that I considered smart and who was an executive in, in corporate America. It turns out that those folks are generally not my buyer and they have a lot of opinions and a lot of their opinions are, are not basked in reality because they have unlimited budgets. And the companies that I work with don't have that problem. Right. Yeah. So I would I would be very, very cautious about who you're asking advice from. Do talk to smart people, but I would literally go out and try to find who is my ideal buyer. I would have conversations with them about what I'm trying to cobble together uh, and make sure that it's viable, you know, and that could also help you on the pricing side, help you on kind of the, um, the, the productization side of the house. Uh, I would also then like utilize my friendlies, right? So what contacts do I have? Create maps into interesting companies, ask for referrals, and then more importantly, I think this is a, a missed opportunity for a lot of folks, but you know, if you're a finance person and the company you work with has a good culture, you've been a little transparent about kind of what you're looking to do, I would try to turn them into a buyer. And I found a lot of folks that have found a lot of success in establishing kind of a relationship with their previous employer, turning them into their first customer, which then mm -hmm. gives them you know six months, eight months runway, whatever that scenario is. So a couple of things. First of all, all these smart folks who have unlimited budgets after yeah. the podcast, send me over a list. I'd love to chat <laughs> with them. Yeah. Um, but but, but you, in, in that day, though, it was like I was talking to people who were like, you know, Fortune 50 companies. And it's like, <laughs> no, I, I'm working with $8 million to $50 yeah. million companies. It's, 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 it's very, very, very different. <clears throat> yeah, that, there's a, there is a, and I use the word chasm too much today. I don't know why, uh, even on my previous call. $8 million to $2 billion. There's this giant crevasse in the middle. You, know, you think when you're over on the right-hand side of that, the fractional money, it, it doesn't even hit their their no. decision matrix. They don't even care about it. It's, it's coffee. Yeah. Not right? even, it's not over, even a rounding error. You know what I mean? Like, right. Yeah, it's not even. Uh, but on the on the left-hand side, it's like the biggest next decision they're going to make. Yeah. Not just because of the investment, but because of the strategic nature of the investment. That person or those persons are going to help them craft their next 6, 12, 18 months. Totally. And and that's a big deal because they're putting a big bet on that. Now you mentioned that the that our wealthy uh, Fortune 50 people over here are not your ideal buyer, right? Can you give someone uh, you you kind of talked about it the the at the very beginning? Um, how would someone craft their ideal buyer? Is it just a person they're working with now? 
Uh, in, in regards to the buyer within a company they essentially want to work with, if yes. they're optional. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that kind of comes down to the, the ICP creation, right? So I've, I've got a simple like eight question matrix that you, you walk through that kind of helps people suss out who their ICP is, you know, what the, what the footprint is of that, of that division, right? So if you're mm -hmm. to use the finance example, you know, maybe this person's going to be a CFO. So is there an acting CFO? Is the, is the, is the founder currently running the books? Do they have that function outsourced? Do they need to bring it in, mm -hmm. in, in, in house? So I would put my arms around those scenarios. I mean, a lot of it too, you're taking a bet, right? I mean, it's hard to kind of make sure that this is all bass in reality until you're out. As an example, you know, I created a business case when I was going to jump out and literally could have thrown it out the window the second I put my two weeks in because it was worthless. You know, um, maybe it was 70% right. I don't know. But sure. uh, you know, a lot of it is going to happen. You know, a lot of, a lot of the learning happens when you are on the street and you get real-time feedback. And from there, you just iterate. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so I want to thank you for joining me today. I wanted to see if there's something that I've missed, right? Because when we do this, uh, yeah. and I told you this beforehand, uh, off air, I yeah. my old radio comes out when I talk about this. This isn't a live show yet. I'd love to start doing these live. I think live is, brings another dynamic. But uh, I tend to be long in the tooth. And so my interviews have gone an hour and a half typically. Mm -hmm. Feedback has been that they would like us not to be an hour and a half. So we're yeah. trying to get closer to that hour mark. Yeah. We're in about 40 minutes now. Um, but, but that said, I don't know your business as intimately as you do. Have there been areas that I haven't hit or what are the things that I haven't talked about that you sit there and go, man, I wish someone would ask me this question. Is there something like that that's nagging at you right now? Man. So, so Derek, first and foremost, thanks for having me on. Um, I, I feel like we've covered a lot of ground today. And, and so I, I don't feel if anything's been missed. Um, I will say for those folks that are kicking the tires on the fractional side of the house, there are resources out there. I'm always happy to have a conversation. Um, I actually do have some coaching services that we offer in regards to folks that are that need some support, kind of a, a done with you type of model in regards to kind of creating an ICP and sussing out, you know, kind of is there is this a viable option, right? Um, but there are much more resources that are out there. Um, there can be some confusion in the market because, as I mentioned, you know, the last couple of years, this this whole fractional ride and waves is really starting to take off, particularly on the talent side of the house. Um, but I, I'm happy to help de demystify in, in any questions that folks in the audience may have. Um, but otherwise, no, I feel we've, we've done a pretty pretty detailed walk through a business, the model. I mean, I'm happy to talk through pricing and best practices. Um, but I feel like we've done a pretty pretty comprehensive overview on our target and and um, and the like. Okay. Well, I, I will obviously put all of the information with your contact information, website, et cetera. I've gotten most of that for, from you. So the the audience for my podcast are usually people that I've worked with in the past. And I don't think a lot of them are using fractional. Uh, I, like my former founder had not used a fractional until I yeah. went there. And then uh, this actually, of course, uh, as I'm wrapping it up, I come up with another question. Imagine that. <laughs> Bring it on. Hashtag, man. Let's, go. Let's go. Hashtag rookie move. Yeah. How do you counsel your fractional uh, stable, as it were, mm -hmm. when when the person wants to marry them, right? So they decide they're going to be fractional. I'm going to change my life. I'm going to be fractional. I'm going to be fractional. I have a six-month contract. Then there's another six-month contract on the end of that. And But now that second six-month, they don't want me just two days a week. They want me three days a week. Sure. Now they want me four days a week. Do you see this being the natural progression or is that – what what what's the bell curve there? How does it yeah. break down? No, so it really depends on the person. I, I talk to people and I actually will put people to work that will, you, you could never hire. I mean, everybody has a, has a price, but I, I literally work with folks <laughs> where, where, where it's like, hey, no, I, I'm never, I, I can't do it. I've, I've got I've got zero interest in working for somebody or working with somebody, you know, 40 hours a week in that capacity, period. Gotcha. I've got others, others too, though, that are, are pretty clear about, you know, um, their, their interests and they may be, Hey, I'll, in fact, I had a conversation with the, this is the CRO is about two months ago. And the guy was like, Hey, I've had three great rides, three great exits. Um, I will never go full time again, unless I can do a six month contract. And we're having discussions along the course of that six months on what a package would look like on the outside. But he was very, very mm -hmm. transparent. So I think it depends on kind of what, what your, your motivation is and what your interests are. Um, but if you are looking for full-time employment after that contract, I, I do think it's, it's important for individuals to be upfront about that. And, you know, my expectation is that at the end of this six-month period, if, if everybody's still happy and things are moving in accordance to plan, 
that we will move into, you know, kind of phase two of, of this relationship. Yeah, there, there are a couple of things that as I'm looking at my notes here and doing our wrap up came across really loud and clear that I want to reemphasize. <laughs> uh, and if I don't cover them well enough, fill the gaps for me. Yeah. Uh, don't do this if you're not truly entrepreneurial and into the biz dev aspects. And I think that's one of the things that when mm -hmm. I did it the first time 16 years ago and I'm doing it now, yeah. uh, that biz dev side is non-trivial, right? That, that cold, hard look and the work to go ask for referrals. And that's going to lead me into point two. And then you can, can close this out with how badly I've butchered these topics. Um, that biz dev aspect, there mm -hmm. is no one right way, but there are tons of wrong ways. Right. Right. So the the work, the grinding it out has got to be something that you don't do because you have to. You do because it is part of something you're willing to do. You have to find right. a way to make it passion for you. Uh, and the second one is don't avoid talking about packages. And and we can make jokes <clears throat> all we want about using the word package here. But finance matters. Yeah. And understanding that there are two parties to this. Totally. Right? Yeah. And and it, they're, it, they're not dirty words. No. Right. It is not a hobby. Your job, your job title is not philanthropist. Right? I had a friend who she was so smart. She's like, I want one day my job title to be philanthropist because yeah. I'll know I got there. Right? That's not what this is. Did I did I did I miss anything yeah. on those two topics? No, I do not work for free. Right? I know. Right. I totally get it. I'm gonna answer those in, in reverse order. But the component about kind of the package, particularly somebody who's looking to kind of move from contract to perm, I, I would never put off having the tough discussions when your contract's about to end. Right. Like I would start having those conversations at the beginning and again, be very clear. Like, this is my intention. Is that in your, is that your intention? Are we aligned? Yeah. Are we this aligned? Is, right. This is a package is what it needs to look like. And over the course of the six months, I'm continuous, continually validating that we're aligned. So at, you know, day, whatever, 180 or whatever that is, you know, th there are no, no questions. In fact, I'm just hoping you give me more money. Right. Um, mm -hmm. In regards to the biz dev component, you mentioned the wrong way. And a, a, a big trap that I do see with a lot of folks in the fractional space, I fall into this myself. I, candidly, like three years ago, I thought I was done with business development. You know, I, I created this great little business and the referral engine was humming. You know, I was getting introduced to people weekly and then COVID happened and all that stopped. You know, and I felt like I had to build my, my business from scratch to some extent. And the wrong way is that I found that a lot that some fractionals when they're when they're working or maybe they're in an interim capacity, they've got a contract. And they do back burner biz dev, they back burner networking because uh, they're heads down um, in the work at hand and they get caught. And newsflash people, and I, and I use this phrase a lot, but like your, your fractional engagement does have an end date. It just hasn't been discussed <laughs> yet. Right. Yeah. And so I see that a lot of people wake up and they're like, Bo, like I've, got a, I've got a significant shortfall, like cash. I, I've, I've got to I've got to bring companies in and they, they neglected the business development. And a lot of times that's the reason why. So. Uh, that's a, a great reminder. Uh, you talked about something else that is a dirty word to me for reasons that I can't quite articulate, but networking, uh, you seem to do it effortlessly. Oh. Um, it was, it was obvious when I met, I, I met both through LinkedIn actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, you know, LinkedIn is six standard deviations away from Facebook, but it used to be 12. And right. so uh, trying to figure out how to navigate those waters is interesting. Uh, so thanks for coming on the show and talking about your model. Uh, again, I'll do a recap after this. And this this podcast will be live. If someone's listening to this, they're listening to it a week from Friday. Um, but uh, if there's anything that uh, that we can ever do to have you back on or if we can continue our collaboration, if you hear things that are interesting, we'll make sure people get a hold of you. Is there a way they should get a hold of you that you want to articulate here? Email, sure. Twitter. Uh, I, maybe you have a TikTok for all I know. I'm not oh, sure. I, I'm, I'm, I'm an, I'm an old soul, man. I, I literally, the only social media I have is, is LinkedIn. I, I'm not on any of that other crap. I don't care. What oh, God bless are. you. I don't care what other people are doing, you know, but, um, and, and yes, I'd love to collaborate again. Maybe I'm your first host on the live version, right? Or first, uh, first guest. Guest on the live version. Nice. Yeah. But, uh, so the, the, the URL for the company is thefreeagent.com. Don't ask me how I got that. Um, and then LinkedIn. <laughs> It's Bo, B-E-A-U, Billington, and it's not pronounced Boo. And I'd say those are kind of the, the two best places. Uh, I've got a podcast as well, and maybe you can add that to the notes, but that's fine in the next year. But Derek, I really appreciate the time, man. Really enjoyed the conversation as well as the uh, the energy and the thought-provoking questions. So um, awesome, man. I really appreciate you having me on.
My pleasure. Love to come on your podcast if it makes sense for what your topics are. And certainly when we do the live thing, uh, I've got to get an audience that's significant enough for live because when I did my sports podcast, it was easy. You get yeah. a couple hundred people talking about football anytime you want. Yes. Talking about business stuff is a lot harder. Yeah. But listen, yeah. enjoy your kids. Hopefully you guys are getting some decent weather. We have a cold front down here in Florida, you see. Yeah. It's going to be feels like 104 today, wow. not 108. So I'm going to break oh, out the please. jacket. Yeah. And uh, I'll see you on LinkedIn, my friend. Awesome. Well, I hope you enjoyed that podcast with Bo Billington from thefreeagent.com. Uh, I want to review some of the key takeaways like we do on every one of these podcasts and, and remind you, of course, to subscribe in your podcast provider of choice or on YouTube and, and give us some feedback on whether you think this content was useful, uh, if it helped you, and, and obviously reach out to Bo if you think the free agent can be of particular use to you and your organization, or if you are, in fact, a potential fractional resource. Uh, maybe you're someone who's decided that this is this free agency thing is is right up your alley and you think that Bo and his team could help you out, be sure to get out to them at thefreeagent.com. But the five key takeaways from this episode really are that, that fractional leadership or fractional executives uh, can provide both strategic and tactical support. One of the things we talked about in, that, in this podcast was you don't have to make a long-term decision for these really critical positions. As Bo mentioned, this has been used in time memoriam for almost any other position. Staff augmentation sometimes became a dirty word and it really never should have been. The idea of being able to proportionally scale up and scale down your organization as you need to is really logical. The challenge was the logical endpoint never continued high enough into the organization. And so that's what Bo and his team do. Um, the second point is about around commitment and engagement. You've got to find out a model that allows there to be an appropriate amount of commitment and engagement from both the fractional executive and the client. And we talked a little bit about this. And sometimes the, the litmus test or the, the forcing function becomes the investment level. And, and I want to really kind of focus on this one because we talked about it, but it's important to mention whether you're doing fractional executive services or any sort of a contract, make sure that the contract is, is fair, right, and just, meaning it represents a good value for your client. That's important, right? That allows you to maintain integrity. And this gets into a debate we can have on another podcast about value-based versus hourly. And it's a, it's a quagmire, to be honest. But you've got to find something that you're comfortable with. But one of the dimensions that go into that calculation is a level of investment that is significant enough that your client or the people that your client needs you to collaborate with will be incented to make sure they work with you. You cannot be successful on your own in these sorts of engagements. You have to have collaboration from the client. And that commitment and engagement is usually driven by the forcing function of the contract. The third is around demographics and work shift or workforce shifts. As as our workforce continues to age, you have folks like me. I'm, you know, I joked around in the podcast, and I'm not in that last third. He, he gave me a little grace on that cutoff age. But there's a lot of folks who've gone through a lot of experience. And, and mentorship used to be a very common thing. Apprenticeship, which is sort of the inverse of this, when you describe it that way, used to be a very common thing. I honestly don't know why it fell out of favor. We talk about internships all the time, bringing in college students or high school students and helping them learn how to do the things that we do. But we don't often take that sort of age timeline and go the other direction or experience timeline. Age really isn't the point. It's, it's really about experience and exposure. If you are trying to grow your company from a $10 million ARR company to a $100 million ARR company, and you've never done that before, having someone who has as an advisor is really valuable. So this is a way you can go do that. You can go find a person or persons who have done this and learn from them. Now, you may want them to actually hold your hand and help you do it or do it for you. You may just want them to teach you to do it. It's really up to you. But because of the way the workforce is shifting, those resources, those people are out there and they're willing to help. And many of them are going into the fourth key takeaway, transitioning into fractional roles. Now, the, the bullet point talks about the workforce transitioning. I'm going to use this bullet point as a key takeaway for you when you may be considering becoming one of those people, whether it's because you're, you've had a successful exit, whether it's because you just want to change like Bo did when he was sitting in that bar and, and thought how cool it would be that he could be the, the 
equivalent of a sports free agent in his business. Maybe you want more control over your calendar. Work-life balance is becoming more and more of a thing, and it's no longer one of those things that you get the annoying posts in social media saying you're lazy. Um, this isn't a millennials eat avocado toast argument, but when life events bring about change, maybe you're starting a family, maybe uh, there's an illness in the family, maybe there's a relocation, and you need to change that ratio of time spent at work versus time spent at home or doing some other thing, this becomes a really attractive option for you to control your future. Uh, Bo talked about it at length. You're really becoming a solopreneur. Uh, but, but by partnering with someone like Bo, you end up having a funnel created for you. And it may be an option for you to do that rather than going and trying to hang a shingle, as they used to say, and do it all on your own. Last but not least, uh, it's about adaptation to market dynamics. When you see the layoffs that we've had recently in the tech sector, job growth has been solid. And job growth is one of those things that sort of vacillates like everything over time. Whether you're on the provider side, meaning you're providing these sorts of skills and you want to be able to provide yourself a funnel, uh, a, a long-term group of clients that could use your services in some sort of advisory role, in a fractional role, or whether you're on the other side of this and you don't want to grab long-term fixed cost or long-term commitment of equity. When you're talking about this C-suite, quite often it's not just the cash that you're worried about, and that's something that, that any company worries about is managing their cash, but that, that cap stack becomes an issue. How many shares do you want to give out and how quickly do you want to give those out? Sure, you have vesting to, to kind of gate that, but if you're trying to figure out who's going to be the next CFO for your company is going to be a strategic asset to your executive suite, managing your finances, not just the bookkeeping side of it and a controller. These are all really important roles and invoicing and all these critical roles, but actually making finance a strategic asset of your company, which I have met people who can do that. You need to experience it before you invest in it. And I always use the you know potentially gauche analogy. You don't just go marry someone. You date for a while. You, you leave a toothbrush over there. Maybe they give you a drawer at their apartment or you give them a drawer at your apartment. Then you get engaged and then you get married. I, I really don't know in retrospect why it seems to be the case that we take the one of the most critical sets of positions, that, that leadership suite, and we encourage companies to just roll the dice and hope that they can get it right in a panel interview. With things like fractional executive leadership that the free agent provides, uh, this is something you just don't have to do. So I want to thank Bo for coming on the show. I want to thank you guys uh, for listening to the show. And again, hopefully you got value out of this. Uh, we blog at the plane at, at the website at plane-site.net all the time. I'm popping off with something or another. We'll be back uh, after this podcast with our continued series on transformation. And uh, hopefully you uh, you enjoyed this, and we'll see you back for another podcast. <laughs> so much for tuning into another episode of Plain Spoken. I hope today's conversation sparked some new ideas and left you with a few takeaways to ponder or implement in your own journey. If you enjoyed the show and found value in our dialogue, I'd be really grateful if you could hit the subscribe button. Sharing this podcast with your network helps us grow and continue to bring you insightful and engaging content. Don't forget, you can find us on LinkedIn and a few other social platforms. Follow us, interact with our posts, and join the Plain Spoken community. Your thoughts, feedback, and ideas are what keep this conversation going. So please drop us a line or leave us a comment. Thanks again for joining me, Derek Fournier, on Plain Spoken. Keep an eye out for our next episode. And until then, keep growing. What the, what the, what the, what the, what the.